Listener discretion is advised for the introduction of this episode, which mentions sexual violence. Please skip ahead if you don't wish to hear this. It's a sticky summer's day in Florida. The year is 1839. On the banks of the Loxahatchee River, the Snake Clan of the Seminole tribe go about their day. Young women weave baskets, old women sweep the camp, and children play tag running in and out of the houses. The men were off hunting, expected to return soon with meat. For some time, the Seminoles had been at peace with the US government, and no trouble was expected. All of a sudden, the whinny of horses filled the air. From every direction, soldiers stormed into camp, their stark blue uniforms a striking contrast to the earth and colours of the wigwams and longhouses. The Snake Clan already knew. Americans. With barely a word, the soldiers burst into their homes and dragged them out. Every single person was herded into the town square and told to sit. When all were accounted for, a translator was ushered out in front of them, and he told them, quote, The soldiers are going to put you in big boats and send you across the big, big water where you will never come back. The women broke into yells and confused protest. What did he mean? Their tribe was at peace with the Americans. This must be some kind of mistake. But the soldiers shouted them down, forced them back onto the ground. A few tried to run to go and find their warriors, but the Americans beat them until they lay still. The next thing they knew, they were being told to stand up and march, denied even the opportunity to pack a few supplies. Within minutes, the Snake Clan was being marched away from their home. Their journey to the coast took several days, and the soldiers beat anyone who stepped out of line or fell behind. The women did all they could to avoid the stares, the jeers, and the groping hands of their jailers. When the clan finally reached the coast, they were forced into cages, like cattle, as they awaited the arrival of the boat. As the days dragged on, the soldiers grew bored and restless. The more attractive women in the tribe were singled out and raped. One of those women was Mary Tustanuji Tiger. Mary was there with her three children. Determined to save at least some of her family, Mary moved to the edge of her cage and, with her bare hands, dug. She dug and dug. The ground was hard, but she kept going, and soon a hole had formed. When the soldiers won patrol, she sat on top of it to cover it up. After a few days, it was finally big enough, but only for the two youngest of her children. Mary told them they needed to be brave. They needed to get out and find their way back home and tell anyone left what had happened to them. They were just kids and begged their mother not to be forced to leave. Their older sister, who had now been raped so many times now she struggled to walk, told her younger sisters, quote, Go like mother says and don't stop. See me. The soldiers will start on you two next. They have no pity on anyone, young or old. They are like wild beasts. They laugh and kick you around while raping you and make a big joke of it in front of the others. They drive us like cows. You have seen when older people get too sick or too tired to walk, they fall. They get whipped and are made to get back up. If they are too helpless to get up and walk, the soldiers shoot them. If the babies cry too much, the soldiers throw them into a creek or hit them against a rock to kill them. Every Indian that lives through this sorrowful march can never live in peace again. Leave, run for your lives, you'll be free. With a final hug goodbye, the two youngest girls tearfully squeezed themselves through the dirt hole onto the other side of the cage. They looked back one last time at their mother, who reassured them, quote, Just look ahead and don't look back or turn back. Keep running towards the sun until you see your brothers and father. As they disappeared into the night, their mother, sister, and other members of the Snake Clan began singing to draw the attention of the lookouts. They would never see them again, and their experience wasn't unique. It was shared by thousands of Native Americans, herded west to Oklahoma after being forced off their ancestral lands in what's remembered today as the Trail of Tears. The story above comes to us from Betty May Tiger Jumper in her book, A Seminole Legend. Betty May was the first female chieftain of the Seminoles and granddaughter of Mary Tustanuji Tiger. The story is a reminder of what the Seminoles fought for and why they fought as hard as they did. Though Osceola was gone, the war would go on.
Welcome back to Anthology of Heroes, the podcast sharing stories of heroism and defiance from across the ages. Anthology of Heroes is a part of the Evergreen Podcast Network. As usual, I'm your host, Elliot Gates, and this is part three, the conclusion to the story of the Seminole people of Florida and their courageous wars against the United States of America in the mid-19th century. In part one, we walked through some of the most important history of the tribe. We covered their beginnings as an offshoot from another tribe. We talked about some of their most important ceremonies, and we saw the rise of Andrew Jackson, a no-nonsense, no-compromise senator and soon-to-be president. Nicknamed Old Hickory by his own men and Sharp Knife by his Indian foes, Jackson had little regard for Indian sovereignty and even less for black rights. We explored Jackson's wars with the Creek people and how the resistance of one Creek leader inspired a young boy named Osceola. And we finished up the episode with a first-hand account from a tribal chief who was forced to leave his ancestral homeland due to Andrew Jackson's infamous Indian Removal Act. In part two, we saw the rise and fall of Osceola, who, for 18 months, was the figurehead of the Seminole resistance against Andrew Jackson. Charismatic, brave, and headstrong, Osceola was a source of fascination for the American public. He held the line against three veteran U.S. generals with his unorthodox battle tactics, catching their troops unprepared over and over again. As his fame rose, he was in every newspaper, and artists flocked to Florida, desperate to capture his likeness and learn about the man who had caused such trouble for the U.S. Army. But, as they say, the flame that burns brightest burns half as long. Osceola, tired and sick, had died in U.S. custody after being betrayed under the flag of negotiation. Following his death, President Andrew Jackson remained as inflexible as ever. The death of one Seminole meant nothing when all the others still remained at large. Key amongst them were two chiefs, Billy Bowlegs and Abiyaka, experienced chieftains with no plans on giving in any time soon. We've mentioned these two in passing before, but with Osceola gone, these guys would be thrust into the spotlight. So this episode will focus on their resistance and the desperate measures they would resort to in order to cling on to their freedom for another week, another day, another hour. So let's get into it, the conclusion to the story of the Unconquered Seminoles. While Osceola was gone, very little changed on the ground for the Seminoles. Osceola had always been a source of fascination for the US public, and sure, he could certainly get a crowd right up, but he had not been a chief. Over in the White House, Old Hickory, President Jackson, still refused negotiation of any kind. The Seminoles must leave Florida and migrate to Oklahoma. All black or mixed blood tribal members who resided with them must remain behind and return to enslavement on plantations. The Seminoles were in bad shape. 2,000 of them had been rounded up and shipped west, about 400 had been killed in combat, which left somewhere around about 1,000 still living free in Florida. Communication was scattered between the distant swamp villages, which made large-scale warfare very difficult, but not impossible. The mantle of responsibility rested on Billy Bowlegs in central Florida and Abiaka in the deep south, the Everglades. General Jessup, the main man driving the war against them, was getting tired. Out of all the generals that had come and gone from Florida, he had been the most successful by far, but now he kind of felt like he'd done all he could. He'd fulfilled his promise to the president, he'd captured a good majority of Seminoles and sent them west. Hell, he'd even got Osceola but he didn't want to spend the best years of his military career chasing ghosts through the jungle. So he was in the process of handing things over to an up-and-coming colonel named Zachary Taylor. Better known by his nickname, Old Rough and Ready, Taylor was always ready to roll up his sleeves and get down in the mud with his soldiers. A major campaign deep into the uncharted heart of Florida was coming. Colonel Taylor had spent a stack of money mapping out northern and central Florida, but the South was still a bit of a no-man's land. Taylor was hoping that if he beat the Seminoles here, in their heartland, it would show them that they had nowhere to hide and they were better off surrendering. So, with the largest army the USA had put together since their 1812 war with Great Britain, came old rough and ready. Taylor's spies told of a huge Seminole city somewhere around the banks of Lake Okeechobee, 
near modern-day Palm Beach. So this was his first point of call. As Colonel Taylor approached the outskirts of the lake, it was clear that his troops would not have the element of surprise. It was eerily quiet. Not even a single fisherman was visible on the banks. The cavalrymen soon realized that the ground was far too marshy for their horses. The hooves were sinking in over and over and they decided to continue on foot. The vegetation became an enemy of itself. The five foot tall sawgrass cut the men's faces and hands as they waded through the quagmire in up to their ankles. Troops took turn leading the columns, cutting through the vegetation with a machete. In the stifling heat, each man could only last a few minutes before having to rotate. Then, all of a sudden, they cut their way into a corridor. A place where the sawgrass had been stamped down to create a path. Had they stumbled across a secret route that the Indians themselves used? But no, Abiyaka had ordered this path cut. As he suspected, the US troopers would come across it and follow the path of least resistance right into his killing field. From the tree line, he and 400 warriors lay in wait, arrows knocked and rifles primed. Billy Bowlegs, Wildcat, Alligator and many other chieftains had all assembled under one banner. Perched up in the twisting branches of the cypress trees, they watched as the troopers walked right into their trap. There were two men per tree, one standing and the other prone so they could cover each other as they reloaded. The plan was weeks in the making. What precious gunpowder they owned had been rationed out meticulously to each warrior, and their rifle barrels had been recut to accept the crude bullets they'd made themselves. All waited in silence, waiting for the first shot from the old war chief, old Abiyaka, to signal the start of the ambush. Many of the young warriors began to grow restless, but Abiyaka was patient. He had learnt which clothing denoted a higher rank in the US military, and he wanted to ensure he could line up as many officers as possible. He had seen that if these men were killed first, the whites broke into disorder. The first volley had to kill as many as possible. The signal given, the swamp rang out with noise. Abiyaka's patience was rewarded as officers, captains, and even colonels fell by the dozen. The troopers' vision was completely obscured by the sawgrass. They heard the gunfire and the sounds of dead and dying men, but none knew where they were being attacked from. Men ran in all directions, looking desperately for the rest of their column and the commanding officer for guidance. The volunteer troops particularly were panicked without their officers, and many ran back straight to the prairie. Colonel Taylor, who was at the back, rushed forward with a fresh column of men to find out what was going on. Cool-headed as usual, he honed in on the biggest pockets of gunfire and directed fire back at them. A few of the younger braves broke off and began to run, but one of the chiefs, Alligator, raced over to them and blocked their path. To war, to the death, he told them grimly as he motioned them back. The two sides exchanged gunfire, but with Taylor's guidance, the soldiers rallied. With the element of surprise lost, the Seminole gunners began to pull back, keeping up fire so the US troopers couldn't follow them. It was a masterfully planned ambush, one Osceola himself couldn't have topped. Historian John Mahon noted of the battle, quote, Never had Indians prepared a battlefield with greater care. While another historian, Thomas Tucker, stated, quote, The ranking Indian leader Chief Apiaka had organised a brilliant defence. Both sides claimed victory, and while it's true that the Americans held the field by the end of the day, Apiaka's daring plan had decimated the officer corps all while fighting a force that doubled, well, nearly tripled his own in size, with better weapons and equipment. For every Seminole killed, about seven US troops fell. It would be one of the most costly battles of any Indian war in the history of the United States. The Battle of Lake Okeechobee saw the cooperation of many different chiefs and their warriors, a serious rarity for the independently-minded Seminoles. But victories like this didn't just happen. It was the seniority of Abiyaka that kept everyone sticking to one plan. But who was Abiyaka? Where did this guy actually come from? He's not an easy man to research, but let me try and pull back the shroud on this elusive medicine man. Abiyaka, or Sam Jones, was born sometime around 1781. His name, which means wise warrior, gives us a clue as how he rose to the top. Warfare was really the only way up in Seminole society, and Abiyaka lived through a ton of big events in the tribe's history. When the Seminoles had to pick a European power to side with, 
He had helped cozy up to the British and may have been part of a delegation sent to the Caribbean to try and convince them to rejoin the fight against the United States. At somewhere around 80 years old with a life of experiences, he was the closest thing the Seminoles had to a king, especially now with so few chiefs left in Florida. The most intriguing thing about him is how he wore his age as a kind of cloak, like a disguise. To your average soldier, he was just this feeble old Indian. In fact, many that met him actually went out of their way to mention how he was always hunched over and stooped so low he was almost immobile. Others said he was sickly and well on the way to going senile, but if we dig a little deeper, well, take a listen to this American doctor who examined him a few years earlier, quote, It is true that he was sparse and thin in his habit of body, but nothing more than was natural and healthy. The hair on his temples was white, and apparently he bore the age of 55 or 60 years, but otherwise he maintained a nervous and energetic disposition in both his physical frame and his air, gesture and force of speech. He was in a perfect state of health. The doctor finishes his examination noting, quote, He was entirely destitute of the infirmities of old age. Friend or foe, everyone that met him always remarked on his most defining trait, stubbornness. As an American soldier said of him, quote, I have known Abiyaka for many years as a proud, independent, self-willed man who, once having made up his mind, is not likely soon to be diverted from his purpose. During one of the earlier negotiations, Abiyaka was one of the many chiefs summoned by General Clinch. As Clinch tried to turn the screws on the chieftains and threaten them, Abiyaka leant backwards, rocking on the legs of his chair. Clinch stared in bewilderment as the old Indian then proceeded to put his feet up on the table. As Clinch continued on his tirade, Abiyaka decided he'd heard enough and started stamping his feet. Clinch, infuriated, spoke louder and Abiyaka stamped harder. The stomping became so intense that the wooden platform where the chiefs were seated on collapsed, sending them all tumbling to the ground, no doubt concluding negotiations for the day. Abiyaka's outright refusal to negotiate meant his bands were excluded from trading. They had much less contact with white settlers in comparison to Bowlegs or some of the other chiefs. And so the living conditions for he and his band were miserable. They wore rags and sacks that they'd sewn together, They stole supplies from old shipwrecks and they picked spent bullets out of trees to reuse. Surely life in Oklahoma would be easier than this, right? But it wasn't about that anymore, it was about taking a stand. It was almost as if Abiyaka was living purely to spite President Jackson. But Abiyaka's position in the South afforded him the luxury of distance. For Billy Bowlegs, it wasn't as easy. His band was coming into closer and closer contact with the Whites with each passing day. He had to make concessions. Bowlegs was wily. Captain John Sprague, a contemporary who met Bowlegs, said of him, quote, In all respects, he is qualified for supreme command, which he exercises with skill and judgment. He is about 35 years of age, speaks English fluently, active, intelligent, and brave. Billy Bowlegs was a smart guy. He knew that he was fighting a war he couldn't win. With the pace President Jackson was pushing south, the Whites were nibbling at the edges of his territory more and more with each passing day. The swamps had always been his greatest ally, but recently, Colonel Taylor, who had been promoted to Brigadier General Taylor after his battle with Abiyaka, well, Brigadier Taylor had sent in teams of cartographers to map Florida, and Bowleg's swampy hideaways were being cleared out one by one. It was getting harder and harder for Bowlegs and his band to hide. But it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for Andrew Jackson either. In the Senate, he was encountering more opposition than ever before as he tried to justify his war. Again and again, Congress had approved scores of funding, men, munition, and horses, all of which were in great demand across the United States. There were precious few Indians left in Florida, and the ones who were still there lived in squalor, confined to the darkest corners of the peninsula. So what were these huge armies and mappers still doing there? The perspective of the American public had shifted too. I mean, everyone loves an underdog story, don't they? The fact that a handful of poorly armed and isolated tribesmen were defying the power of a modern nation state, well, it's admirable, it's impressive, isn't it? It's what we as humans like to read about, don't we? Senators began grilling the president further on why this war was so important. By 1837, President Jackson's two terms were up, 
and one of the most controversial presidents of all time, stepped down. But if the Seminoles hoped that Sharp Knife's exodus would give them some breathing room, no such luck. His new successor was Martin Van Buren, an old friend of his. The new Secretary of War, likewise, was another one of his old buddies. And despite stepping down, his shadow loomed large and he still held sway. In one of his letters he wrote to them, he pressures them to finish off the Seminoles at all costs. Quote, Put an end to this Punic War or die in the attempt. Following it up with, quote, Find where their women are and capture them. This done, they will at once surrender. It's easy to see why he wanted this thing done and dusted. By now, Jackson's baby, the Indian Removal Act, was in full swing. This wasn't just about the Seminoles anymore. Many other tribes were being forced off their land. Powerful and organised tribes like the Cherokees had even begun to challenge the legality of their removal. Some had even taken their case all the way to the US Supreme Court. Opposition was building, and the ex-president knew that if he faltered, if he gave one concession, word would spread that government policy could be negotiated, and that was dangerous. Billy Bowlegs and his followers were in the crosshairs, and Andrew Jackson's cronies were about to come at them with everything they had. As bloodhounds began prowling through Bowlegs' swamp, he hit back wherever he could. His attacks were now all small scale. There were no more 400-man ambushes waiting in the sawgrass. All Bowlegs could do was rely on surprise. Once troopers began to fire back, he disappeared. A particularly costly exchange took place when Bowlegs ambushed a newly built trading post. The building had a strong guard of soldiers, and when the Indians sighted them, the men immediately went for their recently supplied Colt rifles. Unfortunately, at that moment, they realized that they had not been supplied with ammunition to go with the Colts. Throwing their useless guns aside, the troops ran for it, all while Bowlegs and his men gunned them all down, 16 dead. In retaliation, an expedition was organized. The Seminoles that apparently had committed the massacre were caught and hung, and their bodies were left on the gallows to rot as a warning. Abiyaka was sickened to hear about how the bodies of these warriors were being disrespected and remarked, quote, We have given them, meaning soldiers from the USA, heretofore when prisoners, a decent death and shot them instead of hanging them like a dog. This shows us how the Seminoles viewed warfare compared to the Americans. An attack on a trading post of men who couldn't fire back was seen as perfectly legitimate. After all, the odds were against them. They felt they had to take victories wherever they could find them. Bowlegs and his men's saving grace were their cornfields. Florida is well known for having these raised tracts of fertile land in the middle of its swamps. They call them hammocks. Hidden deep in the marshes were these secret little food stores where enough food was grown to keep the warriors and their families going. These were a nightmare to find, but each time the whites destroyed one, it was a serious hit to the Seminole war chest. Once a hammock was located, Bowlegs had no choice but to abandon it. There simply weren't enough men to defend them anymore. As Brigadier Thompson planned his next expedition, rumours came to him that the Wahoo Swamp still had many little hammocks hidden away. The Wahoo had been raided many times already. US troopers had confiscated scores of corn, pigs, chickens and weapons. Heavily depopulated and desolate, most believed it was pacified and the Seminoles had abandoned it. But some were insistent that the Wahoo still held more secrets. And so 50 men crammed into a canoe and followed through a tiny winding waterway. Thick with willows and almost overgrown, the troops must have thought the venture a complete waste of their time. There were no signs of habitation. The forest here was so dense, surely no one could live there. Sloshing through the mud, they pushed through the scrub and found an entire Seminole city. Three villages with 28 structures and endless fields overflowing with pumpkin and corn. Sweat lodges, halls, food stores, weapon manufactories, all of it had been sitting there under their noses. This was one of the biggest scores they'd ever come across, and the Seminoles had kept it hidden all this time. The lodges, the halls, the houses, and the fields were soon put to the torch, and any unlucky Seminoles lingering were captured and sent away for transportation. The capture of this city put the bands in dire straits. Food now became a luxury and many Seminole bands began to mull over the possibility of surrender. 
Two Chiefs were offered $5,000 each if they bought their bands in for relocation. I mean, these are huge sums of money. Officialdata.org says this is the equivalent to 170,000 US dollars in 2023, enough to give these guys a very good head start in Oklahoma. The government also began reaching directly into the tribe, offering set amounts of cash for each warrior, woman, and child that surrendered. And slowly, sadly, bands started to trickle out of the swamp and assemble for deportation. Abiaka had to do something. He needed something to bring the Seminoles together, regardless of band, chief, or location. So he came up with a solution. It's a strategy we see sometimes throughout history when a doomed people are faced with an unwinnable situation. Impossible odds, outnumbered, outgunned, starving, and sick. What could possibly inspire these people to fight on? Spiritual salvation. In this case, a prophet. In his youth, Abiyaka had been involved in another war where someone had declared himself a prophet, and the announcement gave the people something to rally behind. If, in your heart, you believed someone had a connection to the Great Spirit, and that person told you that victory was around the corner, would you keep fighting? Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't, but here, many did. Abiyaka didn't declare himself a prophet. Instead, he highlighted the powers of a 38-year-old man named Atolki Thloko, or Big Wind. We don't know how Big Wind came to be the Messiah, but the start of his powers seemed to have come from when he escaped from a jail in Georgia, declaring that the Great Spirit had opened the door, struck off his chains, and told him that the war against the whites must continue. His followers believed he had a direct line of communication to their creator, who had bestowed special powers on him. He could hear troops approaching before others, he always knew where wild animals were hiding, and he could cause death on those who displeased him. But at the core of his message was something that resonated most with Abiyaka, that the Seminoles must never surrender. It's impossible to quantify the exact impact of the Prophet's influence, but people took his powers seriously. When a group of Seminoles surrendered, there were records of a cleansing ritual being performed at the deportation sites. The ritual was supposed to counter the strong magic that the Prophet would use to kill them for betraying the cause. With all their hammocks now gone, food became such a scarcity that some bands of Seminoles would attend negotiation ceremonies just to get a meal. They'd sit down politely, listen to some city official lecture them about Oklahoma for a few hours, gorge themselves at the snack table, and then disappear back into the swamps. The location of the remaining Seminole camps now became a guarded secret. The different bands stayed tight-lipped about where they ate and where they slept. Bowlegs and his men adjusted their sleep schedule. Becoming almost nocturnal, they did most of their travelling and work by the moonlight. They jumped from log to log as to not leave footprints, and when there were no logs, they crawled or walked backwards over their tracks to confuse trackers. In some areas, he banned the shooting of rifles due to the noise it made. In 1841, Chief Wildcat, the son-in-law of Abiyaka, surrendered. If you remember our last episode... Wildcat was the guy that Abiyaka shouted down at the tribal council when he spoke of surrender. Though we haven't covered his life, he was a very influential chief, and his surrender paints a rich picture of how emotional these ceremonies must have been. The end of the line for those that had resisted for so long. This description comes to us again from Captain John Sprague, who uses Wildcat's seminal name, Koakuchi. Quote, Koakuchi and his warriors came up slowly to the quarter deck of the transport. Their feet irons hardly enabled them to step four inches and arrange themselves according to rank. As they laid their manacled hands upon their knees before them, in the presence of so many whom they had so long hunted as foes, they hung their heads in silence. Not a cheering voice or expression could be seen or heard among the group. He then gives us a very poignant, very sad speech from Wildcat. In a subdued tone in front of all those who looked upon him as their leader and the men he'd fought against, he relayed this sad story, which I think is worth reading in full. Quote, I was once a boy when I saw the white man afar off. I hunted in these woods, first with a bow and arrow, then with a rifle. I saw the white man and was told he was my enemy. I could not shoot him as I would a wolf or bear, yet like these he came upon me. Horses, cattle and fields he took from me. He said he was my friend. He abused our women and children and told us to go from the land. Still, he gave me his hand in friendship. We took it. 
Whilst taking it, he had a snake in the other. His tongue was forked, he lied, and he stung us. I asked but for a small piece of these lands, enough to plant and live upon, far south, a spot where I could place the ashes of my kindred, a spot only sufficient upon which I could lay my wife and child. This was not granted to me. I was put in a prison, I escaped. I have been again taken, you have brought me back. I am here. I feel the irons in my heart. I have listened to your talk. You and your officers have taken us by the hand in friendship. I thank you for bringing me back. I can now see my warriors, my women and children. The Great Spirit thanks you. The heart of this poor Indian thanks you. We know but little. We have no books which tell all things, but we have the Great Spirit, the moon and the stars. These told me last night that you would be our friend. I give you my word. It is the word of a warrior, a chief, a brave. It is the word of Kawakuchi. It is true I have fought like a man, so have my warriors, but the whites are too strong for us. I wish now to have my band around me and go to Arkansas. As Kawakuchi's ship pushed off from the harbour, there were now about 600 Seminoles left in Florida. By 1842, the pendulum of Congress had finally swung back against Andrew Jackson's cronies. John Tyler, who had always been fiercely anti-Jackson, was elected as the 10th President of the United States. The inauguration of President Tyler was the best thing that had happened to the Seminoles in years. The new president refused to waste any more money chasing around a handful of impoverished Indians through the hardest terrain in the country. US policy towards the Seminoles had finally shifted. It was now pretty much whatever. As long as you don't attack us and you stay in your area, you can stay. But don't expect any money from us to help you live there. There would still be incentives to migrate, but no longer would there be patrols actively looking for Seminole hideouts. This led to an improved relationship between Billy Bolegs' band and the whites living on his doorstep. Seminole men were a frequent sight around Tampa, Florida, where they would trade supplies, throw back a few whiskeys, and, if their English was good enough, swap war stories with their old enemies. They were there so regularly that the governor built them their own section where they could perform their ceremonies. The Seminole lifestyle was a source of curiosity for the whites, particularly one of the team sports they would play, where players armed with a stick would hit a ball between two goalposts. This game would eventually develop into the modern sport of lacrosse. While intermingling with the whites was okay with Billy Bowlegs, it wasn't with Albiaca. As suspicious as ever, the old chief banned most contact with whites under pain of death. He couldn't completely cut off trading. Western vices like tobacco and whiskey were too popular. But apart from these, his band kept to himself. From time to time, there was the odd murder, raid or robbery. Though it's hard to pin down these on specific bands, the crimes seem to have usually been perpetrated by outsiders. Roving bands of Seminoles who were either exiled or had never been part of Abiaka or Bolegs' band. Even though according to tribal law, these people were outside their society, the two chieftains made it their top priority to apprehend the troublemakers and hand them over to the whites to administer justice. They knew by now that American society lumped all Seminoles together. Whenever one of them caused trouble, it impacted them all. Soon the bounty for migration had shot up to an incredible $800 per male and $450 per woman and child. Bolegs and Arbiaka were personally offered $10,000 if they agreed to leave. A tour was arranged for Seminoles that had already migrated to Florida to return and spruik the benefits for how good life was in Oklahoma. Wildcat, who was now settled down out west, managed to smuggle a message out to his old friends. Don't leave. Or, if you do, wait as long as possible and make them pay. Billy Bolegs himself, as such a high-profile chieftain, even managed to score a tour of Washington and New York. The Seminole chieftain, dressed in a shirt made of old ship sails and pants crafted from Hessian bags, got the whole VIP experience. As he walked down the bustling streets of New York, a reporter for a local paper jostled to get a statement from him. Asking the famous chief what he thought of their society, Bolegs responded through a translator, quote, Steamboat travel was good. Trains go very fast. The great white father meaning the president, looked young, and New York has many people. But 
the most memorable part of his trip was no doubt his walk through one of the Senate halls. Passing frame after frame of stern-looking white men, the chief stopped at one he recognised. It was old rough and ready Taylor, the man he'd fought, and in his mind defeated, at Lake Okeechobee. Grinning and nodding, Bowlegs tapped on the portrait and told his attendants, Me whip. One can imagine the guards clearing their throat uncomfortably before rushing him along. The tool was meant to impress upon Bowlegs the enormity of the resources that his enemy could draw upon, but he couldn't have cared less. The expedition changed nothing, and whatever vague promises or agreements Bowlegs made, he reneged on them as soon as he got home. By 1841, a new commander wished to make his mark on Florida. Like the other six men that had preceded him, he was sure that it would be he who would force these stubborn Indians to migrate. Zachary Taylor, old rough and ready, had apathetically shifted into a policy of defence and bribery, but Colonel William Worth wanted to go on the offensive again. The rapid expansion of white settlements had reignited conflict all over southern Florida. Forts were built en masse throughout the land, even deep within the swamps. When a rogue band of Seminoles murdered a frontier family, the governor of Florida decided he'd had enough. He marched his men into Bowleg's village and just began trashing the place. He burned all his supplies, destroyed all his houses, and even stole his signature black turban, a gift he'd received from the president on his trip to Washington. The time of good relations was over, and for the next two years, Bowlegs and his dwindling group of veterans lived in the shadows. They smelted breastplates from old coins, they picked spent ammunition from trees and recast them. They did everything they could to hold back the tide. Magic songs were sung, medicine bundles were kept on their person, and the prophet worked overtime casting spells. But finally, in March 1858, with quite literally no food, no ammunition, and no clothing, Chief Billy Bowlegs emerged from the swamps and agreed to leave Florida. Sadly, we've got no record of any speech he gave or any descriptions of the meeting. Perhaps after so much time there was little to say. As the exhausted chief and his 150 followers looked back on their homeland as their ships sailed out to sea, it's impossible to know how they felt. For a proud old warrior like Bowlegs, he had a lifetime of stories to tell and a stack of money to live off. He arrived in Indian Territory as a wealthy landowner, but apart from that I couldn't find anything concrete on what became of him. I saw a few stories that said he fought for the Union in the American Civil War, but the rest of his life is anyone's guess. Years drifted by, and cities sprung up rapidly all through Florida. Indian sightings became increasingly rare. The Indian quarters at Tampa, where Bowlegs and his band traded war stories and played sports, lay barren and overgrown. It had now been 41 years since Andrew Jackson had led his troops into Spanish-controlled Florida. Nine presidents had come and gone. Seven generals had entered and exited Florida. The United States had spent somewhere between 20 and 60 million dollars but finally now, it was done. Wasn't it? At the very bottom tip of Florida lay a place that American soldiers still feared to tread. They called it the Devil's Garden. Owned by an ancient Indian chief that time had almost forgotten, a handful of Seminoles lived in the deepest, darkest swamps of the land. Living on whatever vegetables would grow in this dark grotto was the Devil. The almost 100-year-old Abiyaka still remained. With him were somewhere between 50 and 150 Seminoles who still stubbornly refused to leave. What did Abiyaka say all those years ago? He'd live off an island and cut up old pans to make hooks? Well, for a while that's exactly what he did. A bunch of tiny sandbars off the southern tip of Florida, today known as the Indian Key, became the temporary home of Abiyaka and his band. In between these bars of sand was a hidden reef that caused a ton of shipwrecks for any captain who ventured too close. When a ship ran aground, his Seminoles would scour the wreck for survivors and supplies. Spanish, French or British sailors were treated well. The chief would tend to their wounds and send them on their way, but if the ship was American, any survivors found were killed on the spot. Living off the salvage they took from these sunken ships, Abiyaka's band had kept themselves alive, just barely. 
When the authorities learnt that an old Indian had set himself up in the Keys, they scrambled a fleet to retake the islands. Finally, they'd get him, the last flicker of resistance left in Florida. But before they got there, Abiyakra and his band slipped back into the swamps again. Disembarking, they followed his tracks deep into the Everglades, determined to catch him once and for all. Captain Abner Doubleday, the man who is incorrectly credited with inventing baseball, tells us of the absolute mess they had trying to chase this 100-year-old man through the swamps, quote, The men sank up to the middle in slimy mud, and their progress became slow and laborious. The men were often obliged to cross floating islands that could hardly bear their weight. In some cases, they fell through and would have drowned were it not for the prompt assistance of their comrades. Our labour became, if possible, more severe, the water being deeper, floating islands being more frequent, and the roots of trees embedded in slime. Abiyaka and his followers did not want to be found. With almost a century of knowledge saved up in his wrinkled head, Abiyaka navigated his band through the twisted waterways that only he knew. He enforced a strict no-contact-with-whites policy. For collusion or even contact with whites, even just to trade, he was known to order executions. Seminole children were taught to turn their backs on any whites they came across and ignore any attempts at friendship. Women were forbidden to look a white person in the eye. The man understood that their culture and their lifestyle was a hair's breadth away from being scrubbed from history. The last record of contact with Abiyaka was during the American Civil War, when Confederate soldiers tracked him down to ensure his band was not aiding Union soldiers. We don't know when Abiyaka died or how old he was when he did, but it was the framework that he put in place that kept Seminole culture alive over the decades that followed. Their traditional way of life continued. The green corn ceremony, the black drink ritual, their language, somewhere deep in the dark Everglades, it all continued like it had since time immemorial. As the years passed and the Union won the Civil War, Florida became more industrialized. Rails of the newly invented locomotive train began to spread across the now well-mapped state. By the year 1900, Florida was getting smaller, getting safer. And the murky swamps, which had always been the greatest ally to the Seminoles, were drained to create farmland. The timid Seminoles, who for generations had lived as quietly as possible, were confronted with a new reality. The white people that had once chased them into the woods were not the same ones that now met their gaze over the drained swamps. Times had changed. Andrew Jackson was long dead and his Indian Removal Act was already considered a stain on the country's consciousness by many in power. The Seminoles were forced to open up, at least partially, to Western society. Trading posts were slowly established, English literacy became more common, and Christianity became the predominant religion. But Abiyaka's legacy loomed large. In the 1920s, a group of Seminoles were invited to an event in Madison Square Gardens, New York. Midway through the performance, a speaker made a pretty tasteless joke about how that after the show finishes, the Seminoles in attendance would then be deported to Oklahoma. A riot almost broke out as the Seminole tribesmen clambered over seats sprinting to the exit. Even as late as 1933, a bunch of Seminoles were attending a festival south of Tampa when they noticed a fleet of boats heading for the shores. They too panicked and tried to escape, fearing that even now, 100 years later since the end of the wars, the government was still trying to force them out of their lands. With their traditional hunting grounds being reduced by industrialization, the Seminoles again entered a period of poverty before cashing in on a new industry, tourism. Gorpers from other states had taken to holidaying in Florida, and they took an interest in watching the Seminoles go about their daily chores, still living the traditional way. So they began to arrange tours. Souvenirs were created, and the now famous Seminole cloth, with its colourful checkered patches, was sewed into dresses for housewives all across states to show off to their neighbours. The men realised that their alligator hunts drew big crowds and began to wrestle the reptiles for the entertainment. Slowly, many Seminole bands began to move into reservations, but these were no longer in Oklahoma. Instead, they were based upon the lands that they'd always lived on. Five reservations were created in Florida. The largest one, called Big Cypress, lies just south of Lake Okeechobee, the site of Billy Bowlegs and Abiyaka's greatest victory. Like many other Native American tribes, 
The Seminoles have made good use of their land to skirt around the tight regulations around casinos and gaming laws. And this, along with other well-thought-out business ventures, has enabled them to thrive in the modern day. In 2006, the Seminole tribe purchased Hard Rock Cafe, a well-known international burger franchise for $965 million US dollars. Dressed in their now iconic Seminole patchwork, Max Osceola Jr., the chairman of the tribe, announced to reporters, quote, You're here for a special day in Seminole history. Our ancestors sold Manhattan for trinkets. We're now going to buy Manhattan back, one burger at a time. Today, there are around 4,500 Floridian Seminoles, most of which are descendants from those few who stayed behind with Abiaka. They no longer live in chickies or wigwams, and while a few hundred speak the Seminole language, English is now predominant. They look and act like every other American, but for all of them, they have a history that most of us are completely ignorant to, a history so unique and special. As a non-resident of the United States, I would say the Seminoles are not a well-known tribe. The names of Billy Bowlegs, Abiaka, or even Osceola are virtually unknown against the crowd favourites of Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, Red Cloud, or Geronimo. A few statues around Florida are some of the only reminders that hint to this incredible legacy. In all the episodes I've researched, I've never come across people with such determination to really, and I mean really, stick it out until they had nothing left to give. So it's my hope that next time you're sitting at Hard Rock Cafe, chowing down on a burger while you look at a framed white jumpsuit supposedly worn by Elvis Presley, perhaps you'll think back to this fascinating group of people and what they endured to be here today. This has been Anthology of Heroes. If you've made it this far, maybe you'll consider being a patron. The show's patrons, Phil, Angus, Claudia, Malcolm, Alex, Seth, Lisa, and Tom, all throw me a few bucks a month, which allows me to invest in the show. Either way, thanks for listening, and see you on the next one.